flipping that. That means the company is still going and it's going pretty good. I'm going to be talking about, well, first of all, I will introduce myself. My name is Alex. Feel free to shoot any questions during the presentation. If possible, let's you know, move them to the end. But you know, there are some topics I will not cover. So we'll basically uh, be talking about how we've been running this, what have we learned in the process, and what you need to start your company today. Okay. Some things I don't like to talk about a lot, unless I am asked. Like money, you will not see me talking a lot about money, but if you ask me at the end of the presentation, I don't like to put slides, I just like to be talking about that. Feel free, feel free to follow me on Twitter, let's interact there. And I'm the co-founder and basically managing the business development area of, of this company, is called Marsbase. I'm also regional director of Star Brand, uh, but we'll be covering Marsbase today. Cool, can we shut off the lights maybe? So that you can, you can. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. I unplug this. Yeah. Is that safe? No. I will not die. Okay. Much better, right? You can, you can read now. Good. How many people here is into tech? Are you tech guys? Okay, that's a great portion. How many people have heard of Mars Space before this? What the fuck were you, the rest? <laughs> I, I didn't pay these three guys in the, in the last room. Actually, uh, we just hired Riol today. So he's our latest hire, that's why he's here today. Otherwise, we'll fire him right away. So, a little bit of introduction. Mars Maze is a dev shop. So basically, we develop things for other people, mainly for other businesses. We are a consultancy, and we provide consulting services and development using these technologies that if you're in Ironhack, you might know them because they're the coolest technologies in Earth. Basically, Ruby and Rails, and everything is very <coughs> to web applications. He is a PHP or Python defender, so uh, Python. Feel, feel free to bash oh. them anytime and move them. Move oh. <laughs> and as the name implies, as the name implies, we come from that little bit red planet over there. That's called uh, that's called Mars. Cool. A little bit of background. Why I'm here today? I'm not gonna be just talking about things we did right. But I'm, be, I'm going to be talking about a lot of things where we fucked up, mainly some projects that we tried to launch before the company. So basically, before being a services company, we tried to launch three, two and a half startups. The first one didn't, didn't even count. But I want, to, I want to give a little bit of background so that you, when we are talking about the specific topics later, you will see, ah, okay, that's where they fucked up, right? So basically, first we tried to launch Woliba, which was a social network connecting producers and consumers of biological food. That is, I'm going to France, I'm going to Toulouse, and I want to buy the best honey in the region. So I search it, I get the contact, kind of like TripAdvisor for Biofood. Well, have you ever heard of something like this today in the market? No. If the market's not yet ready for this, it was in 2010, okay? First fuck up. Don't do things before time. So then we said, okay, if we don't have people interested in that, maybe we build something that we will use ourselves. And we thought, what could we possibly use and our girlfriends, wife, or friends, or parents, whatever. It's a digital, uh, so it's a di digital uh, recipe book. That was called Cooking Me. It's actually an open source project. Feel free to play around with them. And this was great because it didn't require a lot of people. So you didn't enter that vicious circle of, I don't have users, so the platform is never going to be interesting to other people, so we'll never have users, and full circle, full circle, right? So I said, let's create something that we will use ourselves. The mistake we did here is, we are so focused on details, we were polishing everything, ironing out all the bugs, and making the UX so incredible, that a competitor sprung up and took the market. The competitor is called Cookbook, and they're from Barcelona, they're an awesome app, they were named like App of the Year by Apple, and something like that. So we said, okay guys, time to close up. Why? Why am I talking about this? Like you will say, dude, this fucking sucks. Why are you talking about failures? I don't know you're gonna like, say something useful. You can learn from all of this. Basically, we learned that we didn't know how to sell products. We didn't know marketing. So we didn't know how to research the market. We didn't know how to create you know, interest for a product. And we didn't even have contacts or investment because we were not full time. We were working on our spare hours, weekends, after our working shift. And that was a complete failure because you need a lot of dedication. So basically, we just discovered something else. We discovered that we knew how to make apps. We were good at you know, designing apps, developing them, 
and making kick-ass applications. Now I said, okay, why don't we do services instead of product? Because it's easier. We can start with just one project, build up from there. And we don't require people to be paid for, for that in order to sustain ourselves. That's good. This is the first lesson learned. And that's <coughs> when we change. Basically, like almost three years ago, we rebranded. We spent some time working on the company. I'm going to go back to this a little bit later. But basically, January 2014, so two years ago, we turned into a consulting company. Do you guys know what pivoting is? Do I need to explain? So basically, for the people who don't know what it is, it's basically testing things in the market and changing your company according to what you find. So let's say, is the market ready for that? Is there interest in this product? No, okay, let's change. Let's do something else. Cool, is the, uh, this, we launched this project for Spain. Is Spain the right country? Yes, let's go to that. But what region? Madrid? No. Basque country? Yes, okay, then we go to the Basque country. Small iterations, small changes, that they will bring you to the, your final product or company or project. So, after a couple of months, I was asked to talk at the first Iron Hat, and there was no real employees in my company. It didn't even exist. I was like, dude, I'm not going to talk at Iron Hat. I don't have anything to explain. It's like, yeah, you'll do great. Just do theory stuff. So, after a couple of years, I'm very proud to say that this is the third, I think it's the fifth time I speak here at Iron Hat, and now we've got nine employees full time plus four freelancers outsourcing stuff. So, it's been a change. Now I've got real stuff. I will be talking about real stuff. Don't worry about it. Cool. Let's say first things you need to when you create a company. This is gonna be I'm gonna be covering so the basics: team, clients, sales, marketing, dedication, whatever. First thing is clients, right? So if you've got no money, company doesn't run. Unless you're working for something else, you've got a side <coughs> thing, all that. But we're talking about you want to be committed and you want to create your company that sustains yourself, right? What is a good approach to find clients? We did the fragmentation grenade technique, which basically consists in offering shitloads of different services and see which one sticks. You know what a fragmentation grenade is something that explodes in millions of parts and then might hurt somebody. So basically you do that. So we were offering like websites, web applications, maybe mobile, responsive, design, blah, blah, blah. But we found out that only one or two were sticking with our clients. Responsive websites and web applications. We said, okay, let's discard the rest and let's just focus on this. Because that means there's a product market fit, right? So you're offering something that the market requires. In, in fact, as in <coughs> development, there are not many companies specialized like us. There might be two or three in Spain that they are specialized in Ruby and Rails only web applications. So there's enough, enough space for somebody else. They say, good. First, you diverge offer a lot branch of uh, products or services, and then you converge on what works for you. Cool. Then, you might need a theme, right? There's one thing where we fucked up when we were in the beginning. I said, we were not committed to that. We were not working full time. What happens when you're not working full time? That basically takes a lot of time to get things done, right? So you need to go straight away 100% working for your company. How do you do that? You might be asking yourself, you might be saying to yourself like, no, I will wait till I have more time, till I have some money in the bank, till I have a big client, till I have something, a good forecast of six months of revenue or something like that. If you're waiting all the time, you will never have the opportunity. It's the other way around. If you start working and you feel like the shortage of money, it's, oh man, I need to move, otherwise I'm so fucked up, okay? So this is a good thing. Most people even wait to have a, a really good team. I'm suggesting one here. If you want to start a startup right away, whatever the startup is about, just try this team. Have a developer, basically need somewhat, somebody from Iron Hack if possible. They make great people. Salesperson, I'm gonna be covering a lot because I'm doing business development here. And an MFIC. Do you guys know what an MFIC is? No, nobody? Not even you? No. It's a motherfucker in charge. So the motherfucker in charge basically <clears throat> makes sure that the developer develops what the salesman can sell and the salesman sells what the developer can develop. It's difficult to pronounce, but it's really true. It's, so technical people, you know, we get lost. I was a developer first, so we get lost in, I need to refactor this, I want to test a new library, I want to try this new interface or API or whatever. Yeah, but you need to get shit done. You need to ship your code and sell it, right? 
where our salespeople was like, yeah, I will try this new market, I will fly to Berlin, see what happens, I will attend conferences. No, man, you need to sell what we can do, okay? That's the motherfucker in charge. You know the conference is just called COO, Chief Operations Officer. And it's very basic. In our company, it's very basic. If you, if you were in the company, the company wouldn't even exist. One good thing that you can also do is sell the MVP while you're still in the field. We failed at that. We tried to get the full product before launching, and the competitors, they just like came stronger. They just came up stronger and with a better product and all of that. Because they just launched, they learned from the market, they got all the feedback, they tested the features, they actually got customers and they hurt the customers. We didn't have any customers. So maybe we were launching shit, right? So try to sell the MVP while it's being built. Why I'm saying this? Because you will never have a complete product nowadays. And in negotiation, it will take some. Contract, negotiation, the price, conditions, so that takes two, three weeks to, to close a contract. So you can finish whatever stuff is needed for that contract in these two, three weeks of, you know, of spare time. And um, also, I try to recommend bootstrapping. So bootstrapping means not having to depend on external financing, okay? Working with, with what you've got in your pockets. Why? Because all of these are the three most typical excuses in order not to start a company. So, oh, I don't have a team. I don't have a co-founder. Or, I don't have a product. My product's not ready. Or, I have no money. I need money to create this website. Man, if you're committed 100% to do something, you will find a way to do it. If you're not committed, you will find excuses. And these are the three most typical excuses you will get. Okay? Good. Let's move. Sales. First of all, nobody's going to explain the secrets of sales. Because, you know, if we explain the secrets, then there won't be a secret anymore. But the good thing about sales is that they're just consistency and execution. Okay? I was a developer, and when we created the company, I didn't know Ruby Rails, and I was like, yeah, what I'm gonna do is like, you, you, like, you're gonna do sales. Like, Great, I don't know jack shit about sales. So what am, what am I gonna do? Just go out, attend conferences, go visit clients, and that's why I did. So my, my advice here is, even if your co-founder or your salesperson is not trained in your field, just lock him out, just kick him out of your office, lock him out until he comes back with a contract. Whatever the contract is, you need money to keep running the company. If you give him incentives or like a salary bonus or something like that, it's damn sure they will come back with the, with the contract, okay? But then you also need to feed them from time to time. We don't like to sleep in the streets and it's, it's kind of cold here in Barcelona. So, but I'm gonna give you some advice on how to improve your sales, okay? Things that are critical, you cannot go without them, and things that are nice to have. Things are critical, business cards, okay? No matter how digital we are, these motherfuckers will never die. There's no app that digitizes business cards 100%, okay? There's people who just say, oh, I need a business card, so otherwise I will not contact you because my memory is so terrible. They will never die, okay? <laughs> we thought they were gonna die with the internet, with the cell phones, so smartphones and all of that, they didn't die, they will not die in the next 50 years. You also need an elevator pitch. Everybody knows what an elevator pitch is? Somebody doesn't know what an elevator pitch is? You all know, perfect. Okay, you don't know. I don't. Okay, elevator pitch is, try is trying to explain your project or your company in the time that it takes from one, let's say, one floor to the other in an elevator, okay? If I only have 30 seconds with you because we're going from floor two to four, could you explain your company? That's it. You need to have a wide range of elevator pitch. 10 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, because depending on the kind of presentations you do, you might have more or less time. For instance, if, I, if I'm coming here, I'm probably gonna say the elevator pitch of Mars Base, but uh, I have the whole, the whole time at the wall. But sometimes you, you, you're meeting this famous person and you've got only 30 seconds. Like, holy shit, I need to nail it. So these, these words, you need to know them by memory, okay, by heart. But sometimes you will go to like a pitching competition, to investors, forum, whatever, and you will have five, ten minutes. That's great. That's also an elevator pitch. Okay? And also you need to dress accordingly. This is something that Mark Zuckerberg probably got as a biased opinion on that because he's basically running around in sweater and shorts. But not all of us we can do that, especially if you're doing services. Like I cannot go to talk to banking or insurance 
just with a jumper and shorts and flip flops. It would be great. When I'm gonna be fucking rich, I will do it, okay? But not in the meantime. So dressing also helps. It gives you an impression. At least the first contact, dress okay. And then you can just lose yourself because um, there's a lot of people who do that. They will appreciate the honesty. All the things that they are nice to have, though. Evangelist. An evangelist is somebody that talks really great about your company. Even if they don't know what the fuck you're doing, which is, in fact, most of our evangelists, they are like that. Dude, I don't understand what you do, but I know you're Ruby on Rails, right? I have this friend who needs Ruby on Rails consulting. Can you do that? Yeah. Oh, I don't know what you do, but I've got this friend who needs a WordPress page. Can you do that? No. Okay, that's an evangelist. Somebody that doesn't really know what you're doing, but he will give you referrals or contacts. He will tweet about you. He will post Facebook pictures. He's got shitloads of contacts in the, in the business world, so he'll introduce you to people. And most of all, he will talk like really great. So if, you, if your company depends on a referral or trust building, an evangelist is your key asset. Also, other things that might, they have worked well for us, is producing good content. Like we're getting leads, so business opportunity, because we've got a blog, and we're tweeting stuff like every day. Um, by producing a blog, you get keywords on your website, and you get updated website, which runs well on Google. So people looking for Ruby and Rails development in Barcelona, the first company they find is ours. If you find Ruby and Rails consultants in Barcelona, the first company they find is ours. Why? Because we've been working a lot. But it might not be specifically working for you. So these things take with a pinch of salt, because they might, they might be really specific to us. And then an event. Organizing an event works, works really great. great. We're organizing an event that's called Startup Grind. It's basically a monthly event. Uh, we're doing a next edition next Tuesday, where we interview a famous businessman or an entrepreneur in Barcelona. The event gives you visibility, the option to give, you know, to give handout, swag, or promotional material, and all that stuff. It also positions you as a leader in the market. Like, oh my god, these guys are organizing an event of 120 people every month. They must be doing really great, right? That's what people think, and it's great. You need to make people think that you're doing great. <laughs> Good. What else should we need to cover? Yeah, this is a pretty controversial topic. We get a lot of times we get asked like, oh, you know, I'm not gonna tell you my, my idea. How many of you have got an idea for a company right now? Who wants to start a company? Cool, can you say your name and what the company is about? Uh, my name is John, and my company is about using science and technology to improve productivity, creativity, and well-being of workers. Perfect. What's your name and what's your company about? Uh, your name's, and my idea is really simple. It's just a, a bot, like on the WhatsApp or Telegram, where you just tell him, okay, remind me in 10 minutes to do this, or remind me tomorrow to do this other stuff, or remind me. Perfect. Thank you. Um, in the previous editions of this talk, I always got somebody who's like, no, I'm not gonna tell you. It's like, why? I mean, we're in a closed space. I'm not gonna tweet in the middle of the, of the keynote, right? So it's like, no, because it's my, my idea. You will copy it. You will tell somebody else. And it, it's really great. You might, you know, use it for yourself. I'm like, you know, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> Basically, ideas are worth nothing, okay? Because what counts is the execution. And most likely, if I decide to copy your idea of the bot for Telegram or WhatsApp, you are 10 months ahead of me. <coughs> because you've been running it, you might have already discussed with, with developers, or you might have interviewed people to see whether there was a product market fit or interest, real interest in the, in the product. So you are so ahead of me, I will not catch you up. Unless I have 10 million euros of investment right away, which is most likely not my case. But then again, so no one will steal your idea. So don't do it. Don't do it yourself. If you're going around like, to talk to developers or lawyers or whatever, it's like, don't ask people to sign NDAs. You know why? The main reason is it will make you look like a fucking noob. That means you're a first timer in the business market. Right? No, I will, because I get that three times a week. <laughs> and normally these people are not our clients. Because that shows you're, you're weak, you're alone, and you only have that, it's a sign of weakness. Unless you've got like the cure for a cancer, 
Okay, but then again, you wouldn't be looking on in Google for a developer, right? Or you wouldn't approach us. You'd go to the university or whatever, go to fucking Boston and just do it there. So don't ask for MBAs. It's another thing if you're doing services. Maybe, maybe it helps getting the first contracts. But once you're stable, don't sign them anymore. Because that shows you're doing well enough to you know, filter off these people. You don't, not, you don't need these toxic people. Because these people, if they're so picky about telling you their idea, go figure with the rest of the contract, okay? Might be you send them an offer, five months of negotiation, the contract has got, I don't know, 40 clauses, every single one of them is like carefully changed and detailed, and I, don't, I like to be rephrased like that. You don't want these people. They waste your time, okay? But in the beginning, it might help to get the first contract. Just don't discard it right away. And by talking about your ideas, one other thing is if you've got an idea, it's great to just spread it massively, okay? Send it to all your Facebook contacts. Send an email with a type form asking, would you buy this, would you pay for that, would you be interested in this, do you think there's a company would be interested in <coughs> Not only you will test whether there's an interest in your product, but you will also get feedback. Somebody would say, oh man, there are already 12 apps that do that, don't waste your time. Or, oh, this would be great if you implemented it, if, you, if this part you also implemented it in whatever chat. Oh, and maybe you didn't think of that. You maybe you would have never thought of that. And somebody else has given you an idea. Right? So these are my, my main reasons to, you know, to talk openly about your ideas. You, the, the chances are you're gonna win more than you will lose. Good. Try, measure, improve. There's nothing when you're running a company, say you've got your team, you've got the sales people selling, you've got your idea or your project whatsoever, the company is now operating. You are three, six months since you started. There's something that most companies don't do. We do it probably um, once a month, which is measure everything you're doing, review it, and see if it can be either automated or improved or eliminated from your company. Why? Because sometimes you're just too stuck in your daily grind, in your daily routine, that you will, you will not see, man, why I'm doing like eight hours reporting every Friday? Maybe I can outsource this. Maybe I can automate this. Or maybe I don't need this anymore. These reports were great at the beginning when we were starting, but now everything's going okay. So maybe I can buy uh, software that does it automatically. Maybe we don't need that, we need to change the reports. So once a month, stop, take a step back, take a look at the whole picture, and then see if like, everything's working, how you plan, or you need to update stuff. Because this will allow you to take two steps forward, or three, or four. It's really impressive, whatever you get. You lose one day of productivity, but you gain three, threefold, probably. Good. This is something I have updated from the last time I gave this talk, which is, the fear of missing out. Because the last time I gave this I gave this talk, I think we were only four people. Now we're nine. So we're scaling shit up. <coughs> Basically the company's growing. As the company is growing, you will be co-founders. You will be the CEO, CTO, COO, CSO, whatever, uh, from your really cool company. And you will try to oversee and control everything, right? Because it's your company. It's like your child. And you don't want anything to be like, I want to have the perfect detail of everything, perfect understanding of sales, marketing, human resources, um, I don't know, materials if you even have them, whatever. You can't do that. As the company grows, so do the chores. That means things you shouldn't be worrying about. You should worry about all the areas in your company when you're small, when you don't have enough money. Once you start growing up, delegate, outsource, automate, or eliminate. Basically, you can't do everything, right? Or you can even forget about stuff. So you'll try to prioritize between things that are important, and uh, you should prioritize in two axes, right? Importance and urgency. If it's important and urgent, just do it right away. If it's important but it's not urgent, you can delegate it to somebody else or do it later in time. And if it's not important but it's urgent, have somebody else do it. And if it's not important either or urgent, just fuck it. You don't need that. Because if it's important, they will come back to you. You can forget, oh man, I forgot. 
because otherwise these things will eat you up. But it's great. Um, this is one of the things that have been striking us, like we're three founders of the company in the last six months and now we're overcoming it. It's like, we try to control everything. And then we said, why should we do like the billing and the administration and contracts or buying stuff, making photocopies, all of that. We don't need to do that. If the company is stable enough, you will have money to hire somebody to do that. So, um, maybe you can read really well this one. This is also that as a service company, well, everywhere where a contract is um, involved, you will get a lot, okay? People asking for favors. Contract, I mean, business is business. A contract is something fucking serious. Um, work always with the contract. Don't rely on people, oh, it's, it's for my uncle. Work with the contract, just do a contract. Okay? Or for a friend or a relative, somebody I know, somebody recommended me, work with the contract. Because chances are things will go bad, especially when you're still dealing in the first levels of your company, when you're not well known, you don't know how is it gonna work out, so you might fuck up, or they will not pay you, which is because this is something that you will get a lot in Spain, <coughs> always work with a the contract. There's a contract and there's a bill, the payment is guaranteed, okay? Almost 100%. But without a contract, it's just smoke. They will pay you if they want, whenever they want, maybe not the amount you, you told them. So. And also, don't do favors. Try to avoid doing favors from day one. Again, that's a rookie move. That's like asking for an NDA. If somebody, so let's say for instance, I go to a client and say, okay, the project you want, is 20k. And I say like, yeah, but I only, I only have 10k. Can you do that? It's the first project. Then maybe if I get investment, I'll pay you the rest. Or in the second project, we can compensate. No, don't do that. If you accept, they know that you're weak. Again, that you're a rookie. It's your first year. You will do it because you're desperate for money. Okay. And if you do that, they will forget about this. And in the later stages of the project, they will ask for more favors. Because you already did one, right? So they can talk you into doing more. Like, oh man, you know, now the price per hour, can you lower it? I don't have as much money as I expected. So don't do that. Make them be the first ones to. I mean, if they really want to work with you, they really trust you, they should be making, at least the first agreement should be per one on one. It's fair from my, from my side, it's fair from your side. Then if, if we like you, if I like you, I'll make you a discount. I'll offer you special conditions and expect also from your side. And also, when hiring people, because right now you will be probably in your first year and you will have already investment or shitloads of clients, right? You will need to hire people. Probably you want to scale your business. Try to, at least the first five people, ten people, hire only recommended people, okay? Or people who you have worked with, or people you've known for a lot of time, because, because there's a friendship in between this kind of relationship, they will know not fail you, okay? They will probably... Um, they will stand up when things are going tough, and they will probably you know, <coughs> overcome some sort of situation. So other people would say, no man, you know, this is not my thing, I'm just, I'm just leaving. Great. If you work with recommended people, they will give an extra. Okay? That's why we hired Rio after, because we want him to work 20 hours a day. <laughs> and, um, and that's it. It's very important, because the first hire you will do is one of the biggest decisions you will have to do in your life. How many people here has hired somebody? Okay, one, two, three, okay, great. So basically, I don't know about you guys, but the, the moment I had to sign the contract for our first hire, it's like, man, I'm directly responsible for whether this person eats or not, or his family eats or not. And that's fucking big when you're just, it's your first company, right? Then you get used to that. But the first one is like, I cannot sleep. Like I'm responsible for somebody else's meals on the, on the table. So if it's recommended people, you probably have more trust to deal with that. And Good. <clears throat> yeah. Well, on the other hand, also you have a people that is taking responsibility for the image of your company. Exactly. That is also <coughs> uh, providing something where he is impacting you directly yeah. by his behavior and by his product and his work. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, basically, there's two things to it, right? If they're uh, facing the public, the audience, like, um, they are basically, they are not developers, they have to deal with real people. They, they are the image of your company, right? Or if they are developers or people from manufacturing stuff, they will produce the shit that you're selling. If it's not good, then you're, 
your product or your service is doing. But yeah, those are good points, thank you. Good. When it comes to price, also this is something very controversial in Spain. As a services company, uh, you might already know if some of you have already outsourced development, and I know some of you have, is uh, the average of price per hour in Spain is 25, 30 euros, something like that, right? So ours is 60. How does that work? Okay, we've got other values. We've got quality as a core value. You cannot get quality from really cheap flights, right? You cannot get quality from Ryanair. You expect that the plane's gonna break down in the middle of the flight. So, <laughs> things happen. You know? That happens the same <laughs> with software, okay? Remember that. <laughs> Great, so the, the most important thing here is don't undervalue yourself. If you're selling your, this is mostly for freelancers or services companies, because if you undervalue yourself, say, your hourly fee is 50 euro per hour, but in every contract, you're lowering it down to 30. Then you're a 30 euro per hour person or a company. You're not a 50 hour, uh, euro per hour, okay? Because that's also a sign of weakness, and you need all to do it in strategic projects, maybe some clients, but try not to do it very often, okay? And also, well, yeah, this is something very critical. Avoid these words like the fucking red plague, okay? Partnerships, strategic project, investment project, synergies. That means I'm not going to pay you, okay? It's other words for you're not going to see a single penny from my side. Yeah, this first project, let's treat it as a partnership. Let's do some investment into this because there are synergies. So you can, it's just like a symbiosis, right? You will profit from this, I will profit from that. Yeah, man, but where's the money? <laughs> I'm not saying you should all only work for money, but these kind of clients, you don't want them right away. You will understand that somebody's strategic if they don't tell it to you. Like you will have to suggest it to them, okay? Uh, say, you get the chance to, you get something really, really good that Microsoft could be using. You can approach them like, let's do an investment project and you will use it for free. That's great. Microsoft will open a lot of doors, okay? That, it's a great badge to have on your website. That will get, get you more leads. But that person you knew or you met at an event hasn't got a single penny. That's not strategic. That's strategic if you want to end up failing, okay? So try to avoid this. I also, I, I, we get an average of 10 leads per week, and I, I could say like seven or eight belong to these words. Okay. So yeah, we can do partnership with this company from whatever low cost company that, yeah, you will leave, you, you just send projects into us, we'll give you a fee, or uh, we'll send you back projects when we have them. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> don't trust these people, okay? <coughs> don't do it yourself. Cool. Uh, we're approaching more or less the end. Uh, I prefer to um, answer your questions rather than just talking a lot. But something that is basically one of the most key concepts in entrepreneurship or creating a company, it's focus. Okay? Focus is the ability to concentrate on what's important. Basically, if you're multitasking, you're not concentrating on what's important. Two things cannot be really important at the same time, okay? The more hats you've got, the less credibility. If you approach an investor, or yeah, I'm the CEO of this company, but I came last week as a CEO of the other company, you're, boom, failure, okay? So don't, don't try to be the 100 hats man. And also, if you're not focused, how can you ask your team to be focused? If you're working with three different companies, how can you tell your employees, no man, you should just work for us. But I'm working for three companies. Yeah, credibility. So, you know, whatever, as I said before, things that are neither important or urgent, delegate, outsource, whatever, just get them out of your way. One rule that I do because, so I'm doing Mars Space, but I'm also organizing Startup Brand. But Startup Brand, I merged it into, as a, com as a company project. So now it's a company project. We treat it as a project within the company. The rule that I use is like, is this new opportunity that I've got, is helping me succeed on my company? Yes, I'll try to merge it. I'll find a way so that, you know, both companies profit from one another, blah, blah, blah. No, fuck it. You don't need distractions, okay? You don't need to be distracted. There's a lot of stuff to do. You need to focus 120% uh, of your time a day into your company, not into somebody else's. 
And so, there's another thing that I like to talk about, and it's really critical, and people in Spain don't quite get it. How many people here are from outside of Spain? Cool, 50%. Good. Um, you, know, you probably know Doggy, right? It's my favorite, it's my favorite meme. So basically, Doggy represents what we have as a company culture. Okay? Every company should have a company culture. When you create a company, you should define the values and what your goals are, how you're going to achieve them, how you're going to work, how you're going to talk to your employees, to your clients, how you're going to craft your material, how you're going to package it, how you're going to write your documents and everything. So, and then everything has to be according to the company culture. Because then it also provides a lot of engagement with your employees. Like, yeah, I want to work in a company that's remote working. Like, you know, our company is 100% remote. So you can work wherever you want from Earth. And we've got a guy working in Mexico, just move there. We even have somebody in Murcia. Man, that's real. That's, that's a real accomplishment. And um, we offer flexibility. You can work at night if you want. We don't care. Just get your shit done. You can work 10 hours a week. If you get your shit done, it's okay. <laughs> Right? You don't need to work 40 hours. Um, we focus on quality, not quantity. So everything you do, we expect that you do really few tasks a week, but 100% perfect. Okay? All of these things, we try to transmit them in everything we do. So this creates you know, uh, a way to work. In our company, everything we do is, is remote. So we work remotely. If I weren't be traveling probably 40% of my time, my employees wouldn't, wouldn't feel the urge of traveling themselves and just trying it themselves. Because, oh, the company is remote, but nobody's doing it. Or, you know, uh, they say that you don't do extra time, but uh, I see the, the rest of guys are doing extra time. Or, you know, um, I don't see anybody working from outside the nine to five shift. I'm working on weekends because I take days off during the week sometimes. So th that's a great example. Or you can have, uh, you also offer unlimited vacation. You can have it. It's perfectly okay. I mean, we trust you. It brings in identity. It gives you stuff you can blog about or talk about in the conferences or keynotes you do. And it's fun. I mean, you get to use memes. I try to use memes in whatever thing I do. It's part of the company culture in our space. Our presentations are always like this. Uh, probably for clients, they're not so spacey and psychedelic. But you get a couple of memes in the, in the client presentation sometimes, uh, and it works great, and it produces the wow effect. It's like, wow, I want to work with you, you know? And there's something you want to have. So la pretty much last of all, you gain credibility by being your own company. So if you define your company culture, try to be, try to embody your company values, okay? So if you, if you say your company is quality, don't produce documents that are like drafts and send them to clients with the wrong name and the wrong title and a blank page in between, something like that. If your company focuses on simplicity, then you're, if you send a document that's 60 pages long, you're doing something wrong, okay? Just try to work as you want to transmit. So communicate accordingly. Also communication should be doing that. And most of all, it also it's very important to learn to say no, okay? As I said before, it's really important. Lots of things will come your way. Like, man, you should try this out. It's, uh, you're going to profit in your company. It's going to be a great match for your company. It's like, no, don't have time for that. Probably, probably it's not, even if you try to sell it. And by saying no, you will also know how to deal with that when you're told no. Because I'm doing sales, I get a lot of no's. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. But you also need to say no, because you get a lot of opportunities, distractions everywhere. Everybody wants to be partner of yours. Everybody wants to, to make you test their new product or whatever. It's like, no, I can't do that. Or maybe you can do it if they're real friends, something. But you should also be really honest and upfront. Because if not, you're just being false and dishonest. And this is something you don't want to be. And to, to wrap this up, basically, what happens if you fail? Because as you have said, have you, you probably have seen that we failed in the beginning. But that doesn't spare us from failing one week from now. Or a month from now, we lose our clients or something. Or some, we just hire Bruyol and he turns out to be somebody that wants to destroy the company from within. <laughs> just tell me. <Wait. laughs> what happens if you fail? It's, it's okay. I'm not saying you guys should, yeah, because there's a lot of talk going around. You should fail fast, fail often. No, just don't fail. I mean, make things awesome, okay? Don't fail. Fail is bad. But if it's bad, then you can learn from that. If you fall from your bicycle, you probably, you couldn't avoid it. 
And you learn from that. Man, I will not be drunk next time I get the that the bicycle, right? So you learn from that. You also should never give up. I mean, quitters never win, right? So if you give up, if the guys from Angry Birds have, have given up, they wouldn't have produced Angry Birds as the 50, 51st game they launched in the market. Or the guys at Pinterest, I think they started monetizing or being, you know, having a market share in their eighth time, eighth year of existence. If they had given up, they wouldn't have sold to Facebook. Or they wouldn't have been billionaires by now. Or the guy at WhatsApp, you know? And most of all, share it with others. That's really great. I mean, I've learned a lot from other people's failures. It will spare you from failing. And you'll learn. Uh, people saying, I'm very successful of that bullshit, right? Um, I, I tend to trust more the people that they share the failure because they're much more human <coughs> and they're open. If they're open to share the failures, probably they're not just making shit up. And, well, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's just another meme I told you. I like using memes. Sometimes they are a little bit too much. But, but the real takeaway here is we've gonna be work we're going to be working one third of our lives, right? Uh, for maybe insomniacs like me, we work a little bit more because we can sleep. But ideally, people sleep one third of their lifetime, they work another third, and the other one, they have like other stuff to do. So if you don't have fucking fun, then man, you're just missing out. You're missing out one, one uh, third of your life. So make the most out of it, just try to have fun at work, and create kick ass stuff, okay? Thank you very much, and uh, let's go with it. Um, in the last part, uh, after the pivot, is there something that you regret that you didn't do before? E, yeah, mobile development. We don't do mobile. Okay. Um, and I examined like last year all the opportunities we got, and we missed out on quite a lot of deals because we didn't do mobile. But then again, probably if we had done mobile and web, we wouldn't have been able to focus on what we are good at because we're really good at web, but not mobile. And we would probably have fucked up. So, I don't quite regret it, but there's something I would have implemented a little bit earlier in the company. Now we're just testing with our first project where there's gonna be some mobile info. <coughs> but that's, that's, that's quite it, yeah. Good question. What else? No more questions? Oh yeah. Do you think Barcelona is a good place for starting a company, or would you rather go somewhere else, maybe London or some other place where it's known to be with better um, entrepreneurship culture? That's a, that's a big statement. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Hey, oh, I cannot compare to Brazil. Uh, normally when I get this question, I try to compare it to, to the, the place. I don't know. Um, I think it's a great place, yes. Uh, you will face several difficulties, okay? Um, Basically, uh, sometimes I like to introduce myself as a Barcelona ambassador. Everywhere I go, I just talk very highly of Barcelona. But for business, okay? Here, I'm going to say bad stuff. You'll figure out the rest. I mean, the good stuff is already there. And if you come from Brazil, you probably know that that pretty much is more or less what you have in Brazil. Like, good food, good weather, nice people, beach, and, and all that. But business is different, right? Um, especially, we have to fight back the image that everybody's got that Barcelona is a place for party. Party, beach, toros, paella, and all that, ole ole. I lived two years in Germany, and I know that. <laughs> I was getting that every day. And um, so basically, here you will have a lot of red tape, okay? A lot of bureaucracy. I want to set up a company. Oh, it takes three weeks. It takes three fucking weeks. It takes a notary, it takes a bookkeeper, it takes the registration of the brand, takes 3,000 euro up front that you might use right away, blah, 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 and this and that. It's like, and you need to do it in person, you need to have a postal office, you need to have this and an administrator, then pay taxes completely regardless of whether you're making an income or not, and all of that. That's quite shitty if you ask me, right? Um, but in spite of that, uh, I, I think it's still, there are countries that are doing much worse. There is also a language barrier. So, uh, in spite of, you know, the last year's improvement, most people don't talk business English, okay? You'll get, yeah, people that just go by with English, lots of companies that will not deal with English at all, 
people that are very close and they was like, no, no, man, just in Catalan. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not, uh, they're probably not just looking, uh, they're just thinking, uh, if I'm in Spain, it's great, then I can expand to South America, which is really awesome, and you've got millions of people there. But I would rather have people that are more open-minded and thinking about being global instead of just language focused. And there's something else. Yeah, there's something else. Here, um, people are very risk averse. So uh, people that are just not going to quit their job until they have 100% certainty that they can sustain themselves for six months or something like that. Investors, I'm not a product guy. I wouldn't be able to talk or to give a very big picture of how investors are. But from what I get, I mean, I do start Frank. So I've been doing that for two years. And so I, I interview and I talk a lot, a lot with uh, entrepreneurs. And the main consensus is, if you're looking for investment, go abroad. Just don't look for investment here, okay? Uh, that's, that's the bad things. The good things you will figure them out. But I would rather focus on the bad things. And they are pretty bad, if, if you ask me. But it's fun. I mean, you want to work and live in the best city of the world, right? So you'll find a way, as I said before, if you're committed, you'll find a way to overcome all these obstacles. If you're not, you'll just find excuses. Excuses. I mean, um, yeah, just one last thing. When we created the company, we're not sure that, you know, we, so we create a company that's not focused on the price. We're competing with quality. And Spain is a country that technically, they don't outsource a lot. And when they outsource, they prefer to outsource to South America or third world countries where they can get like shit done for $5. It's only $5 an hour, man. <laughs> then it will break down most of the time. <laughs> but at least, you know, the budget is easy to justify. But you can, if, if you're in a company, you cannot outsource. Like I've been talking to big companies like the Lord, for instance so that they outsource to us. It's like, no, man, we cannot outsource to a company that's charging 60 euro per hour. It's like, man, you're fucking employed, you know? You should be doing that. <laughs> uh, where are you uh, outsourcing? Yeah, we're outsourcing to whatever country for 20 bucks an hour or 15. It's like, hey, great, good luck, okay? So even if big companies don't do that, just, you know, we thought that there would be no market for us. Like, who pays for quality stuff in Spain when you always go for the cheapest shit you can get, right? Um, instead, we found those. Because we just, we would have said, okay, no, there's no business, that's an excuse, right? And we would have closed down. Instead, we kind of re reoriented ourselves, looked abroad, uh, looked to compete with other companies that, or associate with other companies that are doing that, learn from them, and we found a way. We found a way, and we just found that there's a lot of market for that. Go, please. What is the best way for you to test the market beyond uh, what you just said about and messages and asking for feedback? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends on whether you have a con uh, product or service, right? I would say, because I'm not a product guy, but, and we, as I said before, we, we didn't have any idea, you, you saw it in the first slides. But um, things that work a lot is trying to produce your, your MVP, right? Uh, like, um, but MVP doesn't really mean you need to have a web platform or an, an app. An MVP can also be like an online forum. So you can just ask people and, and see if they, uh, if they would pay for that. For instance, the guys at Stripe, you know Stripe, the payment platform? Hey, uh, basically, uh, their MVP was something that was not made for the public, something that they could use only themselves. So they would go to clients, they would say, okay, we have built this, you cannot have it yet, but would you pay for it? And they were like, yeah, because most of the times you will get a yes. But then when it comes to the payment, they'll say, oh, no, man, no, not now. Mm -hmm. okay? So they say, okay, so we're setting a bit now. So they, they, just, they just fire up the laptop and say, okay, so what's the credit card? What's your uh, billing address and all that? It's like, oh, man, you said you were interested. Let's just set it up and then you will have it working. You cannot set it up because the platform is not yet available, but we can set it up for you. And you will have it working at the end of the minute. That's an MVP. That was great. That's a very good example. Or sometimes it's just a, uh, you have. Um, I have some friends that they are creating an app for um, kindergarten. So in order to see what uh, extra hours their children have. So after kindergarten they go to music or they go to swimming or something like that. But uh, it's spares for all the parents to pick the children in school, and they're basically just grouping them together, and somebody's grading them. Okay. 
And that's really great. What, how they did it? They just went to, like, when they were in the, uh, at the end of the kindergarten shift, I'm like, so, uh, where did you come from? And, oh, I was in the office. Was that a pain in the ass? Yeah, would you pay for, you know, somebody to group this?